the hardest thing with mental health is it becomes a spiral. And sometimes all you literally need is a little catalyst to like help you to stop. When I'm in pain or when I'm suffering, like I have a really hard time reaching out and asking for help. I know it's so hard to talk about mental health, but when you don't talk about it, you feel more isolated, you feel more alone. If you feel something in your gut, if you feel something's wrong, you should, you know, talk to them about that. Sometimes starting a conversation with someone about their mental health can seem awkward, but your support can make a huge difference. And I think that that's hopeful in those, like, really dark times. You might not know what to say, but there are a lot of things you can say to open things up. I know you're going through some stuff, and I want you to know I'm here. You know, I deal with the same issues as well. Maybe it's me, but I was wondering if you're all right. Learn more about how to start the conversation at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Good morning, fam. How y'all doing? Good, good. Good to see you all. Thank you for being here at chapel again. Um, well, that video you just saw, tomorrow is Mental Health uh, Awareness Day by the World Health Organization. And so it's just a reminder. We want to keep reminding you of the resources that are available to you. So after this chapel, the mental health advocate team, they'll be outside the doors. They'll have a table set up if you want information on how to connect with them. But we just want you to know that, hey, if you're, if you're struggling, we all struggle at times, don't be afraid to reach out that we have people here in the community who are willing to walk with you. Um, now, um, our special guest for Spiritual Emphasis Week, uh, you heard from Micah on Monday. He's back again with us today. And uh, he's got a special guest with him, uh, Lucy. Thank you for being here. This is Lucy's first time at Roberts Wesleyan. Can y'all show Lucy some love here? Yeah. Really glad that you could be here with us. We want you to feel free uh, to bless us in any way that the Lord leads you. Also, there's been a, a slight change with the open mic concert tonight. It will not be in Schuen Hall. It will be in Ellen Stowe. Uh, Micah prefers a cozy room. And so we want it to be close-knit, community feel. And please, if you've got some poetry, some of you all say you got some, like, secret stuff that you've been working on. They want you to bring your material to read it and share it. Uh, it's really that kind of environment. So please feel free to do that. So that's at Ellen Stowe at 8 p.m. tonight. Poets, writers, come on, bring your stuff. We know you got something. We can't sleep on each other here at Roberts. Got some gifted people. And I'll leave it at that. All right. So before I get out of the way, let's pray uh, and acknowledge God's presence. Heavenly Father, we thank you um, just for your presence with us. Thank you that, um, that we have life and breath. Thank you that we have an opportunity to take a, a pause throughout our day to reflect on you and how you are at work in our lives. Thank you for our guests this morning. I pray that they would feel at home and at ease. I pray that you would give them clarity of thought and focus, that you would direct their ideas and their flow this morning, and that it would speak directly to our hearts. And we thank you for this time together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's welcome Lucy as she comes. She's all alone Her secrets are weighing her down What is love, she'd ask As she watched herself get dressed Wondered if love would come around She'd fall to her knees, pray somebody please save 
far from herself She'd fall to her knees Pray somebody please Save her from herself She couldn't understand why she couldn't keep a man. She'd say she didn't need nobody by her side. Or she promised herself she'd never need nobody else. Predicted to protecting herself oh, oh, she'd fall to her knees Pray somebody please Save her from herself She'd fall to her knees Pray somebody please Save from herself oh, oh, Miss Awkward She wished she never pushed away her lovers She wished she didn't hide under the covers She wishes she could know just like the other day She can't fake it She wishes she could love just like them She wishes she could love Fourteen years old, a man took off her clothes, he said. This is what life should feel like. She then promised herself she'd never need no. I'm Lucy. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is so fun. I've actually never like done this kind of thing before, so I'm real excited. Um, so just thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, I'm just gonna pretty much share my story right now, um, 
and really tell you, you know, what God has done in my life. It's been pretty amazing. But um, what I just sang on that song was called Just Like Them. And I will say that story was not 100% my story. Um, but I know people whose story that, that was. Uh, what happened to me, though, what inspired that story is that when I was 13 or 14 years old, I was on MySpace. <laughs> Shouldn't be on MySpace when you're like 12. But, or Facebook, or whatever. But anyways, so this older guy reached out to me. And um, I don't even think I knew him, but he wrote to me and we were, you know, talking. And he tells me, offers um, to help me. And he says, hey, um, you should come over. I would love to teach you how to have sex so that when you get into a relationship, they will love you because you'll know what you're doing. Um, now, by the grace of God, I did not make it over to his house. However, because I didn't go, I think um, the enemy might have used that to put a seed into my mind that I thought I was not good enough. So then literally, because I believed that, every relationship in my life turned out pretty much how he said. I wasn't good enough for pretty much everyone, and I wasn't, um, I was never loved, or I was never whatever, all these things. And so I wanted to share this story because I think it's so important just how something so small like that, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room have been through a lot of things similar or whatever, and how something like that can really affect the way that we see ourselves and what we believe about ourselves. And um, this, this mentality that I was um, not good enough and that I was messed up or broken in some way because of my lack of knowledge or whatever the case was led me to believing that I was never going to get married. So now think of, you know, a young girl, 15 years old, who believes, genuinely believes she's never going to get married because... She's not going to do what everybody else is doing and blah, blah, blah. Now, this is leading me to believe that I am not lovable, that I, am, um, that I don't know how to love. This caused me to grow into this addiction of masturbation for many, many years because I didn't know how else to deal with what was going on in, in me. And um, all of this... was really just lies that I kept believing about myself. When you believe these things, like when you genuinely believe these things about yourself, it made me make certain decisions, right? I'm now living based off of my past, based off of what somebody else said about me. And I am making decisions that are literally leading me into everything that was spoken over me. I was so broken by the end of senior year of high school because I felt so different. I felt rejected by literally everyone. I was a victim, and I, I made myself a victim to everything. I was emotionally unstable. I couldn't have relationships, friendships, or anything. I didn't know how to even relate with my family. I felt like I was just alone because... Um, genuinely believed I was worthless. And um, not only did it become my identity, but um, I realized that I was actually really comfortable in it. What happened with 
the things that were going on in my life. I'm going to take this off because, <clears throat> okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, here's the thing. I got a lot of crap for being the way that I was. I was weird. <laughs> I was awkward. Still, I'm awkward. It's fine. Um, I was I was literally like depressed in high school. I had no good relationships. I needed validation from people. I mean, literally, like you know, partying and all that stuff is fun for a second, but I I got no I got nothing from that. It left me broken every single time. And I say this not to be like parting is bad or whatever. I'm not that person. But I'm just saying that I, because of literally what happened, because of what I believed about myself, I needed, needed, needed validation from people. I needed to know that somebody approved of me. I needed to know that um, I needed people's affirmation for myself. Because I, I genuinely believed I was worth nothing. And, and when you believe that, and then you get into a situation that affirms that, right? Then it leaves you like, why am I even here? Why should I even try. And so what God did was he moved me from Michigan to California. And I really gave my life to Christ. I knew God my whole life, but I really gave my life to Christ um, then when I moved. And um, even, even then, I was serving in church. I was um, in an internship at my church. I was really close with my pastors. I was literally doing everything. I was serving with kids. I was worshiping. I was singing. I was doing everything. And even then, I identified so much with depression, with all the lies that were spoken over me. I'm not enough. I'm not, I'm not like that person. I will never be able to do that, right? Right? I'll never be able to go up and speak in front of people and have confidence like that girl. Literally, this happened a few years ago. I was, um, I believed every single lie. And I was in church. I was, you know, present. I was worshiping God. And even then, I was like, I'm an addict. I am, I'm, I'm just not them. And not only was it my identity, but like I said, I got really comfortable with it. I knew how to live in that world. And I feel like we don't really talk about this because it's kind of like self-reflection. Like you have to be honest with yourself. And although there are like a lot of things that we're actually going through and really having to struggle with God about. I mean, there have been so many things that I've been like, God. I don't want to do what you're telling me to do. I really don't. And I've been super honest with God on my journey because I'm like, I am no good at being fake. I don't even know how to lie. Like, I'm just the worst. And so if I'm, if I'm going to go to God, then I'm just going to be super real. Like, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do what you're telling me to do. I don't want to be this person. I actually like, I kind of like this sin. By kind of, I mean a lot. I liked it. And I was comfortable. And God, with so much grace, kept telling me, kept repeating to me that he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins, that he set us free, that all the wonderful things that are very true and very powerful, and I've heard that my whole life. So I was like, why isn't anything changing? If that's true, why isn't anything changing for me? And I thought about, um, I thought about 
the story of, I'm probably going to completely butcher this story, so sorry if you've heard it, and I'm just destroying it. But the story about, you know, that really um, big man that was uh, stuck in a room, and it didn't have any doors, it didn't have any locks, but it was his prison. All he had to do was, I think, I'm just making this part up, they fed him cake or something, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> something, and all he had to do was just stop eating as much, and he would be free. Or he had to just stop, I don't know, he just had to change his lifestyle a little bit and he would be free. He'd be able to walk out the doors, but because he didn't fit through the doors, he was stuck. And that was literally me. That was me. I was free. God set me free. He literally, I mean, there have been countless times where I've experienced the presence of God. And I've been like, thank you, Jesus, for this freedom. Thank you, God, for what you did on the cross. And still, I was going home depressed, right? I was going home crying. Still don't feel like I was enough. Thought about suicide many times throughout my life. <clears throat> and these are all really real things. And none of this is to negate anything that anyone is going through at all. This is real stuff. But what I'm saying is that we are free. That is available to us. That is good news. God literally sent his son so that we would be free. And when I started to... I was so tired of, like, the church, um, you know, you go to church, you're praising God for one moment, you're happy, you're like, thank you, Jesus, then you go home and everything is crap, and you're like, who am I, and blah, blah, I hated that, I was so over it, and having to make decisions and seeing my life literally fall apart before my eyes, I was like, God, I really need your help, and... God heard my prayer, and he did things in a way that I hated. <laughs> but he heard my prayer, and he literally plucked me out of a comfortable situation that I was in, which was living with my family in California, and moved me into a very uncomfortable situation where I was living on a couch for three months with my friends. <sighs> that was not fun. Um, if you've ever slept on a couch... For more than three days. <laughs> it's terrible. So anyways, um, I was there for three months. And even then, I still decided, I think I'm good in my own decisions, in my just thinking, believing what I believe about myself. I think I'm, this is, I don't know how to break out of this. And then God was like, no, no, no. Here's the thing, Lucy, is that you don't know who you are. You don't know how I see you. You don't know what I think of you. You don't know what I've called you to. And if you knew who I've called you to be, if you knew what I've called you to do, you wouldn't be okay here. You really wouldn't be okay here. And I was like, uh, okay, God, then figure it out because I don't know how to, I don't know how to, to move on from where I'm at right now. I don't know how to move out of this mentality of myself. I don't know how to move out of depression. I don't know how to move out of anxiety. So God literally moved me from my friend's house to the one place where you cannot hide, and that was my pastor's house. <laughs> literally, I lived with my pastors for 10 months. Guys, this is just a rant. This has nothing to do with anything. They have two kids. One was three and one is five. <laughs> Homegirl didn't sleep for like six months because the three-year-old son was having night terrors every single night. Like, like he was screaming at the top of his lungs. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I had to get ready in the dark. Guys, it was terrible. Anyways, I'm still working through that part because the Lord knows. And on top of that, I slept on an air mattress that the kids popped two months in. So I was sleeping on the floor for seven months. Yes, exactly. The Lord will do it. But this is, <laughs> this is, 
this is a story about God knew what I needed. He knew that I identified myself as a rebel. I was a rebel when I was younger. My family calls me a rebel, all these things, whatever. So he knew that I'm not just going to do things because you tell me to or because the church tells me to or because I live with my pastors and they tell me to. I'm not going to do that. I want to hear from God and I want to know that I know that God spoke to me about this. I want to know that God himself has a plan for me and has something for me that only he could give me. I wanted to know the truth. I wanted to know what he thought about me. And so he took me into that season, 10 months with them, the best and worst 10 months of my life, where God began to heal very small things. At that point, I wasn't really comfortable in it anymore. I was like, God, I, I want to change. But if I'm completely honest with you, I don't know how to live free. I actually don't know how to do that. I only know how to be depressed. <laughs> I only know how to be sad and weird all the time. I only know how to think that I'm addicted to this. What do I do if, I, if I'm not? Honestly. No, honestly. Can we talk about it? In this world, if I'm going to live a pure life, how do I do that? There is nothing that I can go on social media about or nothing I can really look up and be like, this is going to help me. I talk to my friends, but I'm like, I genuinely don't know how to do this, God. I don't. I don't know how to not be a victim. I don't know what it is like to not need everyone's approval. <laughs> like, literally, I had no idea. It's all I'd done my whole life. So now it became, okay, that was my identity, and then I was comfortable in it. And now I'm like, I don't really want to be this person. I'm not really comfortable, but I genuinely don't know how to be anything else. I don't even know what it looks like to be confident. Because if I'm too confident, then I'm arrogant or I'm prideful. If I'm not confident, then I'm not confident and I'm insecure. I'm comparing myself all the time. What do you do? And God, God showed me something. And I'm going to be really honest. I'm still in the middle of this. So I'm like right here. This is where I'm at. God, how do I do that? How do I do these things that you've called me to be and to do? But what God started with was making sure that I knew who I was and who God has called me to be. Because remember, the seed that was planted affected my identity and that caused a chain reaction in my decisions. So now God is just redoing, redoing it. He's like, okay, I'm going to plant a new seed. Just believe me when I tell you that you are loved. What happens if you believe me? What would happen if you actually believed that you are loved by God himself. The creator of the, universe, of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ who died for you. What would happen to you if you actually believed that God loves you with everything that he has? Woo! That would be so fire. That would be so fire. I'm talking like California right now. That would be so cool. No, like we would have a confidence. We would have power in our words. We wouldn't talk about, I wouldn't look in the mirror and talk about myself the way that I have. I would look at myself and say, I am a daughter of a king, literally. Not metaphorically, literally. 
That gives me access. That gives me power in my words to speak things that are not as if they were. To speak things that are not as if they were. Look at your situation, right? That situation. And then you speak something over it as if it was already happening. My family is healed in Jesus' name. I am healed in Jesus' name. I am not my past in Jesus' name. I am not broken in Jesus' name. I am not my sickness in Jesus' name. I am not depressed in Jesus' name. I am loved. I am holy because God says I'm holy despite what my past says. I am enough. God is pleased with me. He's my dad. And I am his daughter. I am a light. I am not too weird or too different for God to use me. I am a masterpiece and I matter. You are seen. God loves you. He says that you are enough. He says that you are holy. He says that you are a light. That you are not your depression. You are not your anxiety. You are not your sickness. You are a child of God. And he loves you. And he has a plan for you. It is a miracle that I get to be standing here right now. I have done nothing to deserve this. But I promise God has plans bigger for your life than you could ever think of. And he will, he will teach you how to become this person that he already sees you as. And he will heal you from things you didn't even know you needed healing from. God, I thank you for this time. And I... Just um, ask that you would plant seeds today and that you would um, do what only you can do, Holy Spirit. We trust you and we want to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. awkward awesome 
so we're not done. <laughs> um, great. Just kidding, everybody. Everybody can sit back down. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to bring Micah up here because he's awesome and we all love him. Mike, oh, it's not on? How you turn? Oh, there we go. Uh, she did me dirty. The worst thing you could do is make people think chapel is over. And they'd be like, psych, somebody else need to talk to you. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> it's all good. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to share a little bit with y'all. But first, um, me and Lucy, we actually do some music together. As, and so we're going to do one of the songs we have uh, together. And then I'm going to share some poetry for y'all. So, um, I'm just going to intro this song real quick. Um, you know, I've never really, I've been thankful uh, that when it comes to mental health, I've always had a pretty strong mind. And I've been through a lot of things in my life, but I've never really suffered from that. And I have a lot of sympathy for those who do. However... The interesting thing, uh, even though I haven't had insecurities um, or hated myself um, because I'm struggling with mental health, I have had insecurities and at times hated myself because of the story that the culture I grew up in tells me about what it means to be black, which is primarily a negative thing. Um, and... This song is written, uh, really, both of our experiences uh, with that. But even though I'm a dark-skinned black person, like, the narrative, uh, culturally speaking, is the blacker you are, the uglier you are. The language we have, uh, even within the black community, the most attractive black people were the ones with the features that were closest to white people. So if your hair is really coarse, your hair is nappy. If you got good hair, that means, uh, you know, it's longer or wavier or curly, but it's not too African, right? Uh, if you got fat lips or a wide nose, that's ugly. But, you know, if you have features that, again, are closer to white people's features, then you're attractive. You know, you, everybody wants the mixed girl, a half black, half Latina, or half white, you know, with the green eyes and the curly hair and the light skin. And so if that's attractive, then what does that make folks who look like me? Ugly. <laughs> and that's what I was taught from my culture. Uh, and so having to unlearn that and realizing I also am made in the image of God um, was a big part of me maturing and becoming confident in who I was. And uh, so, yeah, we wrote this song together um, because Lucy is Dominican, Afro-Latina. Hey. And... Can tell you if you want to say a few words about your experience with this as well. What yeah. went into this song? Um, are there any Dominicans here? Yes, yeah. I love this. It's all I need right there. I'm so happy. So um, we'll talk after. Don't worry. Okay. So yeah, I mean, literally, it's my culture. Um, I have an afro as well. This is not my hair. <laughs> Didn't need to tell you that, but I just did. So here we are. <laughs> but um, anyways. <laughs> I do have an afro, and I, it wasn't seen as beautiful. It wasn't in my culture. Um, it was very much like, you need to fix that. And um, so I would, I would straighten it. And um, a hair is, a, you know, it's hair, but it really, the way that we believe what is beautiful and what is not really affects you when you're growing up and even even now. And so we wrote this song because just everything that I just talked about, just knowing who I am and believing that I am I am worth, you know, um, that I'm worth it and all these things that I want to teach that to the next generation. I want to teach that to my kids. And I, I want to make sure that I'm in a place where I'm not just teaching it, but I'm living it. And that's why I'm so determined to ask God, like, to to show me how to live this way and how to wh what I should be believing about myself. So this song is called Kiss. Okay, we're not gonna 
ignore it. There's a, I need to tune my guitar, so. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> you guys are awesome. My, my, the one's the best for me. I know she's so sincere. But somewhere in her history, her wisdom bowed down to fear. She told me only fall in love with beauty that was fair. My seeds will grow in grass, my roots could not fulfill. Fear sunk deep into my soul. But I'll face the fire, turn my love to gold. child to love herself I teach my child to love since we're kids by the sun, sun. I teach my child to love I teach my child to love herself I teach my child to love since we're kids by the sun, sun. Yeah, yeah. If I get blessed with a dark daughter Bet that she never be afraid of water Hair not pressed so nothing to mess up Fro so fresh, everybody wanna touch No princess, no Cinderella We gon' read about Asada Shakur and Coretta Civil disobedience, peaceful protest Before she gets slapped with alternative facts Gotta fight back with the truth, we Plant that seed in the youth, please Pray that it grow deep roots so they know what Not to believe at school, see Might be the teacher, might be the text Might be the mean girls or the cool kids Came home sad cause her lips so fat and her hair so Course on the skin so black, child ain't a dang thing wrong with that. Matter of fact, dad thinks you the bomb for that. All praise to the most high God for that. Put your fist in the sky, get a sun so that I'll teach my child to love. I'll teach my child to love herself. I'll teach my child to love since we kids by the sun. sun. Yeah, I'll teach my child to love. White supremacy is the enemy, in the enemy, even centuries after slavery. Still we tend to think light-skinned girls finer than ebony. Ain't no merit in talking proper. Hair ain't good cause it's straight and longer. Name ain't bad because it's complex. I bet Beyonce got teased at recess. Can't you see how they stole our minds? Made us hate on our very own kind. Why we think after all day crimes, everything's better if it's almost white? Rock your puffs and talk your slang. Be proud that you got a unique name. Love your black like it's the new thing. Treat yourself like it's your birthday. I'll teach my child to love I'll teach my child to love herself I'll teach my child to love Since we kids by the sun, sun I'll teach my child to love I'll teach my child to love herself I'll teach my child to love Since we kids by the sun, sun Teach my child to love. I'll teach my child to love herself. Teach my child to love. Like I love. Y'all give it up for Lucy. Thank you, homegirl. So I'm going to just share a little bit to close. Um, 
You know, I, as I said, can you, can you toss me that water bottle, by the way? As I said, um, my, my experience growing up in America, you know, a lot of people, they look around and they say, restaurants and schools aren't segregated, ain't nobody calling you the N-word. You know, what are, what are y'all making such a big deal about? You know, um, and they really don't understand. And, it, and genuinely, there's questions like, what? I mean, nobody's getting like lynched, you know what I'm saying? But when you grow up with messages like that being fed to you, when you're constantly having experiences where you're reminded of not just that people think poorly of you, but they treat you accordingly. I remember one time, I actually was filing my taxes like a responsible American. And uh, I was on the way out, and the next lady was an older white lady. Uh, she was walking in as I was walking out. And the people who I do my taxes with, they're really good friends of my family. And, and so they were like, oh, you know, hey, let me introduce you to, to our other client. And they're like, oh, Micah, you know, he's, he's a, a talented young man. He does poetry. And, and the lady was like, oh, well, can I hear a poem? And I was like, sure. So I spit a poem for her. And she goes, you know, you did look like a hoodlum. And I thought you were a hoodlum, but now that I heard your poetry, I see you're not that. This is the thing. She just said it. But that's true for a lot of people. When they see someone who looks like me, they make all these assumptions. And when you assume that someone is dangerous, when you assume that someone is bad, then you start to operate out of fear. And when you're afraid, everyone is in danger. I'm in danger. If I walk into any room or approach any person and their defenses are up because they assume I'm a bad person because I'm a dark-skinned black dude with dreads, then we're all in danger, especially me. But also, I'm trying to have to navigate that. So even when I, no one is up here calling me the N-word, I walk into any given room and folks is like, beware of this hoodlum over here. And so I have to live my whole life conscious of that, especially when I'm in predominantly white environments like I was when I went to college. Like the other day, uh, I got to speak in a classroom here, and it was pretty much all white kids and two kids who was not white, right? And that black child, that black kid, that black student, um, that black adult at their work has to navigate that all the time. So have we made progress? Of course we've made progress. But I like to say there's no such thing as almost equal. It doesn't exist. So if, if two people get hired for a job at $20 an hour, right, and, uh, and then paycheck comes and the, the black person gets $12 and the, and the white person gets $20 and they complain, hey, I got hired at $20 an hour. You only gave me $12. Oh, you're right. My bad. Here. Next paycheck comes. They get $17. And the white person gets 20. Well, 17 is better than 12, but I'm still complaining. Yo, excuse me, I got hired at $20 an hour. And you all, well, we gave you way more than last week. Okay, but that's still not equality. I deserve the same for the same job. Okay, I do not care if you give me $19.99. I'm complaining. I am marching. I am protesting. Of course we've made progress. But anything less than equality is not equality. And don't tell me to be thankful because I'm not getting $12 an hour. It's unjust. Period. And that's the world I have to navigate, right? So that being said, I just want to end with this one poem. I want to read it because it mentions Frederick Douglass. And I know this city of Rochester is the home and burial place of Frederick Douglass, um, who is a hero of mine. But it's, it's not a fun poem. But this is the reality. I, I felt old when I realized, you know that movie, Back to the Future? The future they go to was four years ago. <laughs> Straight up. It was 2015. I'm like, dang, I'm old. God. Um, anyway, all that to say is I'm not really impressed with the future, to say the least. Um, and this poem is titled 2020. Again, I hope everybody comes out to the concert tonight. We'll be doing more music, more poetry. Bring a poem if you have it. Even if you don't, just show up and enjoy the show. But uh, yeah, this is called 2020. 
five years beyond Back to the Future's future, eight years beyond the Mayan apocalypse, two decades beyond Y2K, we exist in a future we worried would never be. I exist in a history I worry will never die. My white friend cries, ashamed of her naivety, not realizing her father was more than a socially acceptable amount of racist, said he was disgusted at the thought of her holding her new Kenyan boyfriend's hand. I thought of the hugs we've shared, of how repulsed he would be by our gentleness. I thought of King's dream, still a dream. I thought of Langston's dream, still deferred. I wondered how short the fuse must be by now. I thought of Frederick Douglass, of his marriage to a white woman in the 1800s, shortly after his black and depressed wife stopped dreaming forever. I thought of dreams, I thought of future, of how it will disappoint me, of how it is almost 2020 and we still don't have flying cars or hoverbo hoverboards. I thought of time, of how it will not save my children. I thought of love, of how it always takes courage, no matter what century it is beaten and burning and dreaming in. Thank y'all.